well, I'm hoping for this to be the conclusion, there's a, there's a sense of which the um, epistle really is wrapping up at this point in terms of Paul's primary teaching. There's a lot of other personal items that continue on, but even the personal items reflect back into what we're going to be discussing today. So I've, I, I have published a version of notes for you if you want to get them the door by way of review in chapter 14. The first section, verses 1 to 13, was the discussion of the law of liberty, and the second section, verses 14 to 23, the law of love. And we've been through that on multiple occasions, but if, if you have your Bible open, I'd like to zero in really quickly. The verse we're going to sort of be speaking out from the context of today is going to be verse 13. Let us therefore, not therefore, judge one another anymore, but judge this, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. And it's an interesting point of reference because judge not is not, doesn't mean disengage your brain and make no consideration of what's going on. He's trying to get us to recognize what ought to be the objective focus? And so we're going to discuss something today that's pretty difficult because we're, we're, we're summarizing the effect. We have to have the capacity, and this is a collective capacity, to judge. What does it mean not to put stumbling blocks in front of one another? We have to have that kind of decorum. And so uh, this is a, a very difficult kind of engagement because unless we follow the scriptural model, we'll always come up with something very flawed. Uh, and even as we're claiming to follow the scriptural model, there's going to be flaw in it because our tendency is to reduce things to self-operating mechanisms. And we're talking here not about self-operating mechanisms, but a live, continual, paying attention, judging the fact uh, am, am I or are we properly being sensitive to the spiritual reality of people's needs in our lives. And it's that, it's that kind of attention that we bring to the table that makes us a living body. <clears throat> now, if you've traveled the world and cult culturally in any way, shape, or form, you'll, you'll notice there's a distinctive difference in the American culture. Uh, even than just the Western culture. But there's a significant uh, heritage and appreciation in that this very hour reality, Mar Americans value their independence. Americans value their liberty. And they are very staunch in that singular sense of expression. And most of that springs from this passage that we're dealing with in terms of having that necessity of obligation of the individual to spring forth and respond unto God. <clears throat> so it's important, but the problem, with in, rugged, the problem with rugged individualism is that we can be very rough around the edges in how we relate one to another. And our, our sensitivities are really not there. We're, we're insensitive to the larger cultural group. So we're going to have some really interesting, if I could set it up in a certain way, you're going to like feel like you're contradicting yourself. First you say all this good stuff about how we're supposed to respect people standing before God, and then you're trying to say, you know, we've got to put up some fences and corral people in. And I'm not trying to say except that we have to pay attention to the process. Verse 13, again, active voice, judge this whether any man's putting a stumbling block in front of another. And I just want to ask you this question, okay, I don't know what you're doing in your life, but let's just say recently you've gotten the liberty in the Lord to do something new that you know, before you didn't have the liberty to do it, and so you're all excited about taking a hold of that liberty and, do, and doing it. How are you doing it? Are you doing it in such an excited, enthusiastic way that you just want everybody to know about what your liberty is? Or is the first thing that you're asking, which ought to be the first thing we ask, hmm, I'm wondering 
how people might see my expression. And, and is it possible that there could be a little touch of my own pride and arrogance reaching into the arena where I'm trying to make a statement? And that's sort of where we left off last week. So I'm not going to go through this, this list again in terms of discussion, but <clears throat> we did, I'm kind of recapping from last week, the distinction needs to be that we let Jesus be the stumbling stone. When we went over the verses last week, the comprehensive list, it was interesting that the only valid rock of offense is Jesus Christ. And so we have to pay attention that what if you and your manner of living becomes an offense to somebody so that before somebody has a chance to get offended at Jesus, they're offended at you. And from the big picture of judging what our duty is, that is dead wrong. That is sin. For you to be the obstacle to somebody coming to Christ. If Christ isn't the obstacle, then we ought to be paying attention and judging. How can we remove that which I'm, I'm myself? There's an there's a Old Testament, not Old Testament, but in, in the scriptures, I mean, in the Gospels, the... Um, concept was causing the Gentiles to blaspheme. Jews, who by their practice of their Judaism, caused the Gentiles to blaspheme. Oh, what do they do with that kind of a God? And, and it happens all the time. And you have to remember, that's Satan's, Satan, that's all Satan needs to do to get an advantage over people. And it's so easy to criticize and judge someone in the, in the world of interactivity. And you will be judged anyway. But the structural spiritual reality is we've got to make sure that the stumbling stone, the rock of offense, is Jesus. So these are the verses we looked at last week in the, the characterization of it in Romans 9. I removed the verse from Peter, which is a similar expression of it. And then this verse 13 that we spoke of already this morning. But verse 9 of chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians sort of gives us an operating motto. Take heed. Take heed. Now that is an interesting term, because take heed is an active voice process. I get up in the morning and I take heed. I, th I think this morning I might have made a mistake. I didn't wear a tie. This is one of the first times I've ever preached without a tie, except when I was preaching in an Amish church. But there I had my collar buttoned. I don't even, I don't even have my collar buttoned. <laughs> but um, so I, I, it's funny, it bugged me a little bit. Now, was I reckless to do that? I had some friendly reminders that maybe I was, but I thought, I think it'll be okay today for whatever reason. I thought it'd be okay. But taking heed, perhaps I wasn't taking heed. And, and you know, if you're offended by me not wearing a tie, let me know. That'll help me take heed next time. I make Brad have a tie in his office. So anytime I can say, Brad, this is a tie day. So yesterday, Brad had his tie on, and I was dressed like this. When he was going through Brad's mind. Something's wrong with Mr. Cox. So take heed, lest this liberty of yours become a stumbling block of others. It's just so natural for us. And young people, I don't mean this in an unkind way, but it's more natural for you, simply because youth is a continuous experience of new, exciting things. And every time you get to do a new, exciting thing, you really just want to show it off and tell everybody about it. It's kind of natural that way. But in, in real time life, were to be thoughtful and sensitive, what might the impact be of my manner of presentation? And that's what I ought to be thinking. So <clears throat> turning it around then, there's a command coming back at us. I forgot to make the text larger, I'm sorry. Um, I made plenty of room for it and then I didn't blow it up. Matthew 13, Matthew 16, Matthew 18, those are three points of interest. And we're gonna, we're gonna get back to Matthew 18 at least a little bit in context, but I just want to remind us that on Judgment Day, one of the ways God has colored the picture of who the angels are looking for, they're going to come down and they're just going to be looking for people whose attitude was flaunting their liberty so that others were offended. That's a really interesting analysis of Judgment Day. Angels are going to be coming around looking for those little hard-headed show-offs 
who operated out of Romans 1. Can we have a mic? We don't have a mic. Well, what, what passage is that? Romans 1. Okay. Well, I was speaking of Romans 1. Oh, the passage on the screen. The passage about the angel coming in. Right there, Matthew 13, 41. I'm sorry, I didn't blow the passage up. But Matthew, but in Romans chapter 1, the last verse, talks about the attitude of the lost. The lost love to revel in their sin and put it in your faces. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about it all the time, culturally, aren't we? It's not good enough to be, quote unquote, tolerant of views different than us. No, the definition of tolerant by those who revel in sin, definition of tolerance is you have to celebrate our sin. That's what tolerant is. You have to cheer us on and be a part of the party. And if you won't cheer us on and be a part of the party and bake cakes for us, you're condemned. You're put out of business. So it's imperative that we understand. So dads and moms pay really close attention. It is so important that we understand our children's consciences have to be fixed before God on everything that they do. But you're not dumb. You're not dumb. You see the underlying motives. I, I had my children come to me and say, because we had an operational policy, my conscience is not going to be your conscience. You have to have your conscience before God. And it may be that mom and dad are having conscience for things that on all spiritual honesty, you won't have conscience of. That's fine. That'll work out in the future. But we want you to respect our conscionable things. And some of our kids are getting little debates with us and say, well, it's my conscience. And when I'm doing this, I'm pleasing God. <laughs> and it gives me, and, and when I'm doing this, it helps me to please God. And so, you know, really ramping up the rhetoric of how holy the difference is. And I say, well, that's great, but if it's, if it's so holy, if it's so advancing holiness, why are we in this really strongly negative context where you're having a problem respecting me and speaking respectfully? <laughs> Something's not right. So that's what I'm after. And that's what we have to be paying attention to. Now verse 18, excuse me, uh, verse 18, chapter 16, verse 23, we had that little story mentioned last week about Peter. <clears throat> That's, those are really strong words. In my opinion, that's like the strongest words in the Bible. Jesus speaking to a Christian. Jesus speaking to a believer. Jesus speaking to a disciple. And calling him Satan. And I'm just wondering if it's possible for a disciple to be Satan to Jesus. Hmm, I'm wondering if it's possible for a disciple to be a Satan to another believer. And if you look at the structure, it's most possible that you can be Satan to a superior authority over you. Because you're trying to bring in something of your lowly understanding into the midst of a place that somebody's got a higher responsibility and a higher understanding. And you're trying to de re reduce reality to a smaller point of reference. <clears throat> Children, I want to just give you a little hint here. I know mom and dad are grumpy sometimes. Uh, maybe your mom and dad aren't grumpy. I am, though. I I'm get grumpy sometimes a lot. And it's easy for children to look at the grumpy dad and say, you shouldn't be grumpy. And that's true. And we need to walk in humility and ask forgiveness and um, never approve of our grumpiness. But we have to pay attention to the bigger reality because what often happens is a child brings a really minor thing in and all the child sees is this little thing. I was just asking for a cup of water. It's no big thing, it's just a little thing. But. To a parent, maybe they see the rest of the reality that it is a big thing. There's something more to it than that. 
And when the lesser rebukes the greater, those are structures of authority, when the lesser rebukes the greater and is imposing the lesser worldview based on lack of knowledge, and bring it in forcefully so that that's what gets looked at, we have Satan in the midst trying to create confusion and disheveled authority. And you know what? I don't want Satan in the midst of what's going on. And um, I've never called my children Satan to their face, but Jesus called one of his disciples. And I'm imagining that there's at least one disciple that would have been offended. Jesus sinned. He called me Satan. That wasn't nice. You shouldn't call people names. My mommy told me that. <laughs> so we have to pay attention to the bigger picture of what's going on, and we have to learn to live with each other in spite of that bigger picture. And there definitely are things that we do in terms of the community effect and impact different from what we might do privately or as a family. Verse 17 of Matthew 18, which is <clears throat> dealing with a lot of offenses. Woe unto the world because of offenses. It's needful that offenses come, but woe be to that man by whom they come. And that kind of connects back up to verse 41. And this is the, this, this is the reality of the bigger picture. Parents, you're going to have to face difficult stuff with your kids over the years. It's going to happen. There's going to be sin. There's going to be people outside the family that impose things. There's going to be kids in the home that go off the, the what do they call it? Go off the, the ranch or something. Leave the plantation. Oh, they get off the, go off the plantation. <laughs> uh, it's going to happen. So we have to have an outlook that understands and deals with the fact that it's going to happen. But that's no excuse by whom the individual inflicts the happenings. So that, that judgment's not going to be escaped. So moving to chapter 15, <clears throat> I have the summary here of the verses which we looked at last week. And <clears throat> there's, there's several things there that stand out in a, in a simple way. I'm just going to read it through and then go to the next slide. We then who are strong ought to bear, this is the New King James, with the scruples or with the infirmities of those that are weak and not to please ourselves. That's a standard. The stronger support the weaker. The stronger relent on behalf of the weaker who cannot process. Let each one please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. That's so turned around from our modern American culture. It, American culture is all about me reaching the next level, pleasing myself, getting what I want, having it to my personal uh, enjoyment or advantage. For even Christ did not please himself, but as is written, the reproaches of those that reproached you fell on me. So there's the example with Christ. You're, are, you a, are you a Christian? Do you know what Christian means? It means you're a Christ one. You're one of Christ's. So we're called to be like Christ, and that's, that's our model, and that's our pursuit. And when, you know, the whole aspect of Christ coming into the world was about reaching out to people in need, not about celebrating the fact that he's the son of God and the creator of the world and deserves the whole worship of the world. <clears throat> Verse 4, for whatsoever things were written, I like the King James better, sorry, aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. We, we, we read this in Romans 8. What's the definition of hope? Paul said, now we're saved by hope. 
But hope that is blank is not hope. What's that blank? Seen. Oh, seen. Did you say seen? Yeah. Hope that is seen is not hope. For why does he yet hope for it? You got it. So we have to understand, parents, children, have to understand that the Christian life is built on hope, meaning that today I have delay on my expectation. But I have hope that it's surely coming. And so today I live under the delay happily, graciously, willingly, with a cheerful heart with an interest in other people instead of myself, my, the fact that my hope is delayed is okay because it's sure. We have a sure hope. And it's never going to not come about. It's just not come about yet. And so we, we must, we have to recognize that our goal in getting through these items of liberty and Christian community, our goal is to stir up our hope and to recognize, like I did as a little boy, when I complained to my mother that my daddy had certain privileges that I didn't get, and she lovingly said, don't worry, one day you'll be a daddy and you'll have those privileges too. And that there was, she was not apologetic, she was just clarifying the reality. And I tucked it in my heart. I could wait. Didn't have to be now. I could wait for the due time tomorrow. <clears throat> that's so important, and, and moms and dads, that's why raising a family is such a privilege. It's such an opportunity. You have on the right hand, on the left, Hour after hour, minute after minute, day after day, week after week, you continuously have opportunity to teach your children to hope in God. And to delay their hankering and their pressing after gratification in some little area. And like I said last week, it starts at mother's breast as eventually the child is weaned and learns to rest quietly with hope in his mother's lap. That's, that's what family's for. And that's why our culture is so difficult. It's so hard. I, I don't mean this in a really unkind way because I'm thankful for the age I'm in. God put me here, so this is the age to be glad. I'm to be glad. If there's not another age in the past I wish I'd been in, and there's not an age in the future I wish I could be, except the one I know I'm going to be, the final age. But I'm happy to be here. But I see and I recognize the tremendous awkward difficulty we have in our culture because our culture is built around instant gratification, pleasing ourselves, and has very little anymore to do with sacrifice and thoughtfulness of others. We have a very selfish, self-centered culture. And just since, just from the time that my oldest graduated from high school, to this year, where my oldest grandchild is graduating from high school, just in that little window, which could it be one generation? That's close. It, it's 20 years, isn't it? Are you 20 years older than Josiah, or a couple or years more? Anyway, it doesn't matter. 20 years, one, one generation, and just one, one generation. The ex, what? 23, still 20 something. Explosion of technology. We took Daniel to the airport to go on his senior class trip to Europe. And David, who had been doing his piloting stuff, I, I forget exactly how, but he had something really weird called a GPS. And I couldn't believe it. I thought it was illegal. It had to be illegal. Because it was a device that hooked up to satellites. And it could tell where you were. And I'm like, I discovered, well, Airplanes have it. That's how airplanes fly. They use the GPS to guide them where they're going. And, and I'm like, wow, technology. And I forget how much it cost, but it was a lot of money. It was a lot of money. And it's like, and I don't know if he 
I think he bought it and realized it was too much for what it was. But um, GPS. Now today, if you have a phone, you got a GPS. Somebody got irritated with me showing up late for an appointment and handed me a thousand dollar GPS and said, here, don't ever be late again. Well, that's a true story. <laughs> but he was a very generous friend. <laughs> I like friends who correct your problems with practical aids. <laughs> so I don't use this GPS anymore because it's not as good as the one on my phone. That's free. So technology has just catapulted. And there's just so much you can get into trouble with. I mean, if, if it was me starting out right now as a parent, I, I probably want to move into some mountainous region where there's no satellite signals of any kind and build a little hut with log cabin, burn firewood, grow our crops, and get arrested as an extremist. That's, that's actually happening. People try to live off the grid. So it, it's important, and, I, and I, the point that I'm trying to get across to us is this is not something that you can do judiciously and say, okay, so here's what we're going to do, cut and dry, set the rules, we're done. It's a living process. We have got to be engaged and understanding in the process of what's going on in the world. And there are things today that <clears throat> I permit, and I'm saying I permit, it's kind of like they don't have a choice. I mean, <laughs> I'm never letting our kids have a cell phone. That is so wrong. That is just so wrong. And I remember creating the family plans because I want to make sure all the girls have cell phones so they can call if they have a need when they're driving. As soon as the driving took over, you know, we went to the family plan. <laughs> and I doled out, how many texts do you need for help? Not very many. Okay. We're on a limit texting plan, <laughs> a help only plan. <laughs> but things, things change, but there's, it's constantly pressing, constantly pressing. And we have got to be paying attention because here's the deal. Paul said it already. I know that inside the thing, nothing's unclean of itself. The thing itself isn't unclean. Cell phones aren't unclean. I, I had a really cool thing when I was first saved. Listen to some preachers preaching about the horrible, godless new invention called radio. And they were, they were fiery sermons. I mean, they were condemning radio. And what they saw was the potent, the, the radio. It was right after smoke signals. <laughs> but it was, I mean, I just, it was cool. It was these fiery sermons condemning the radio. And then, um, I did hear it on the radio, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and then I, then I heard some preacher who was condemned roundly for saying, well, you know, nothing in itself is sinful. It's how you use it. And if we're thoughtful, maybe we can use the radio for the glory of God. And then went on to, st to state how Christian use of radio has done so much to impact the world for Christ. And... Um, I, you know, I think it was, what's that missionary group called? Radio, come on. No, that's American politics. Um, it's, it's a Christian radio station. They're, they're headquartered in France. HCJB, HCJB yes, the um, broadcasting radio. And they had this incredible ministry all over the world pre preaching the gospel. And, and Jeek Yusefi was telling me a story. He's got a little church in Silver Spring of... Um, Muslim Iranian converts that, that were converted listening to the radio and hearing the gospel in that way. And so, you know, the radio is a powerful tool and the, the most um, wicked device on the earth today is the internet and how it's being used um, for horrible, horrible crime. But that doesn't make the internet evil. It's how you use the internet. And uh, I remember, I know I'm an old fuddy-dud and, and I apologize for that. But some mom yesterday looked at me and greeting me and said, hi, old man. And I was like, it's really obvious, huh? <laughs> I'm really getting old. But um, the, the reality is I, I do tend to resist technology just for the sake of 
technology, let's do it for a prize, but I don't know, David finally got us a website. I don't know, this was 15 years ago or so, I don't remember. How long ago was it, David? Have we had a website for about 15 years now? So that's 15 years plus to 17 years ago. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm like, do we really have the time? Is this really of any value? And so he puts our, our website up. And the day he puts it up, I get a contact from Cambodia, from a pastor in Cambodia, asking for help to start a Christian school in Cambodia. And I'm like astonished. In 24 hours, we reached Cambodia in a way that I had, had no knowledge of. Daniel, microphone please. We broadcast for the first time, we're, we're doing our, our Sunday services live, web, webinars. So I think Mark um, Kelbaugh's at home watching. Hi, Mark. I hope you got sound today. <laughs> and, we, and we broadcast last um, Wednesday our, our workshop and our conference last night, I mean, I mean yesterday. And I was astonished. Somebody clicked on and we had 50 people. We haven't even advertised. We had 50 people watch our, our conference last week um, just in that short time. It's, it's astonishing. Go ahead, Dan. Well, I think, I, I think uh, it's on. Valerie is hopefully watching too. So. Hi, Valerie. Oh, at home? At home, yeah. Lydia, oh, wow. Lydia was sick all night, so I don't know what happened with that. Keep doing prayer. But there's a, a note here I thought was interesting in the context of um, this judging and, and pertinent, uh, considering others, uh, the weaker. That, if you don't mind, I wanted to just read because it had an interesting comment on this that gave a perspective as to exactly what you're saying in terms of the uh, freedom that we have carefully used so that we are not being legalistic and doing away with our freedom, but yet we are looking out for, for those who may not understand. Um, but what it says was um, in that verse you started with, verse 13 of Romans, it says that God um, is concluding here and he's showing what must be done and that he uh, then rebukes. So he's showing what must be done and what must not be done. And what he's saying, what must be done um, is to um, not judging another. And, he say, and they say this, um, he rebukes in this way, these malicious judgers of others with, which occupy their heads about nothing but to find fault with their brother's life, wherein they should rather bestow their wits on this, that they don't with any disdainfulness cast their brothers clean down or in some other way give an offense. And the preventing of the objection is this, that we who have liberty use the liberty in an expedient way that we may regard our weak brother, seeing that our liberty is not lost in any way. So this is interesting because when you have liberty, what it kind of helped me understand was you walk in your liberty and you don't walk on eggshells. And you don't look around, you know, over your shoulder every time you're, in, you know, enjoying your liberty in Christ or you're walking in, in obedience to Christ because you are walking in obedience to Christ. And so you don't, you're not walking with this sense of guilty condemnation constantly. But when something pops up in front of you and you realize, you know what, the Lord brings it to your attention that you have a weaker brother, then because you do have liberty, then you abstain from something for that that point of that purpose and and yet at the same time refusing to be deceitful to that brother about the fact that if they can continue their malicious condemnation that you need to stand up and say well whoa, wait a minute now you're actually off but you know we're abstaining for your your point but we're off uh, you you're, you're getting off here and you know like if someone were to like you were saying last week, um, if someone were to uh, condemn you for Christmas uh, or whatever, you know, you you look, consider those things, but you also be are able to engage them in a 
in a good discussion without losing your liberty kind of thing. But anyway, I don't know if that gave any more but insight, but I thought it was interesting the way it, it said that the instruction was a positive one, but the rebuke was actually heavy-handed towards those who are um, the weaker and being malicious judges of others in their, in their liberty, while at the same time giving strong instruction to the strong to, uh, you know, protect their weaker brother. Well, I, I say at the very least it's the most awkward juxtaposition of community that we'll ever meet in Scripture in terms of, you know, how do we live together with these particular um, potentials, again, judging and despising, you know, the, the two characteristics. Let me, let me just um, back away a little bit from the first thing that you read. As you read it, it sounded very, very... Um, negative, like these horrible, wicked people that are doing this horrible judging in it. And it was expressed so horribly that I immediately dismissed myself. Oh, I'm not like that. And I, and I think that's not the truth. The point of it is judging is much more simple than that. It's much shallower than that. <clears throat> judging is almost done without thinking. We're living ourselves and we have our own conscience before God and we have our own manner in which we're living and we're comfortable in it, and we know that this is what we're doing before God, and we cross somebody's path who does not do what we do. And without thinking, we immediately judge them. Oh, what's wrong with you? And we might even say carelessly, say stuff. Like, and, and we might even not even be know that we're saying careless, stupid stuff because it's so shallow. But we just have such a, an assumed worldview that everybody's living this way. And so I want to back it up. The judging goes way, 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 way more shallower. It's the easiest thing. It's just a passing comment of criticism. I mean, here's what judgment is. I, I enter a room and I measure everybody by me. And that's sin. Because that makes, that reduces God to this one little part, this one little facet of the diamond instead of the many faceted reality of, of who he is. But we have, to, we have to get along when we have to learn how to get along and what does that mean? And I think, you know, regardless of what Spurgeon was trying to say, the fundamental issue that I'm, I'm thinking that the scripture is trying to get us to think about is you, you can only focus on one thing. Okay? And so it's simple. Verse 13 is simply saying this. You're either going to focus on judging whether somebody's doing the right thing or are you going to be focusing on promoting body life so that no one is artificially excluded and, and that there's not any abusive use of my liberty in a way that infringes upon. <clears throat> now, if you've never been a legalist like me, then you don't, maybe you don't have this problem. But I can tell you by testimony, I can tell you by experience that when I have a highly, or maybe I should say deeply rooted conviction, deeply rooted conviction, um, it's like so, so, so wrong not to do that. So it's very powerful, it's very strong. And so it's, it's instantaneous for me to see somebody living differently and then wondering, why are you doing that or why are you not doing this? And it's, it's so easy for me to go there. And so that recognition of carelessness so that instead of becoming a minister of the gospel, I was a minister of abuse. And instead of people having their hearts turned to Jesus, they were like being battered by a, a substand, you know, some standard of expectation. And when I first got in the ministry, when I first came to the Frederick area, it was a, really a battle for me. And God, God was kind in how he put me in situations where he showed me, here's somebody that you condemn, and look what they do for me. And it would just leave me speechless like, you know, because I, you know, I've already made it my mind, you know, this can't be of God. And so the Lord was just teaching me, I've got to let people stand and fall before the Lord and let's, let's keep things in the proper perspective so that we have relationship. And so, you know, as we go forward, I've, I've got, I'd like a little bit of practical conclusion here. Let me finish reading the text, verse 5. 
And may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded. Please notice patience and comfort was in the last verse coming from the scriptures, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So this is called engaged walking in the spirit. It's dynamic, present tense, walking in the spirit. I'm entering in to that secret covering of wisdom from the Lord. And it is the word of God that gives me perspective. And the word of God that gives me that capacity to function. And what has to happen is if I'm dealing with human beings, you know what I've got to have? I've got to have patience. Because you will never be where I think you should be if I'm the one that's overseeing your spiritual progress. I'll always see room for improvement. In fact, that's one of the reasons I think God made moms to help mitigate dads who, not mitigate, but buffer dads who are just always and I've had my children tell me <clears throat> I'm railing at them for the thing they didn't do. And they say, well, dad, look at all that I did do. <laughs> and you know, now they want me to see the whole context. <laughs> and, that's, and that's necessary, that's important. But the spiritual reality is we've got to have patience, we've got to have comfort, we've got to realize we're in process and attend to the process of building faith. Don't attend to the evaluation after the process is finished, which is judgment. That's God's part, and it happens in due time at the end. That's why the scripture says they're going to stand and be judged by Christ. They're not going to be standing and be judged by you. When judgment day happens, you're not going to get to stand next to Jesus, and he's not going to consult with you and say, um, Gary, um, what, what, what do you think about Dale? Um, I've been wondering, you know, you, you lived with him a while. What do you think? <laughs> I am not going to be there. Jesus has got it fixed. And Dale and Jesus are going to know. And the knowing is going to be the revealing. So it's that God of patience. It's that God of comfort whom we're looking to learn how to be like-minded. So I just want to, I want to, I want to blurt out. We have to learn how to be like-minded. And you know what that means? That means leaning into each other a little bit as community instead of leaning out as individualists. At the least, it means that. We've got to have an effort to be a community. And it's really, really easy to be little isolates in our own little world. And we come and go as we see fit and we're thinking of ourselves. And you know, I, I think of some of the frustrations that we have in terms of church etiquette with people you know, and how we behave among each other. And part of that lack of etiquette is we're too narrowly minded. We're just focused on ourselves. It's what my schedule is, what my family needs what we're doing, and when this gets done, then we'll fit it into other things if we can, and if not, that's fine. We'll do this first. You know, I, <laughs> one of my biggest agitations over the years was day after conference, and the church is nearly empty. Everybody's having a PJ day, because we had a big day yesterday. Today's PJ day. <laughs> it's like, okay, people need their downtime. But, but there's another truth here. There's an obligation. And, I, and I'm thinking of the day that we live. There's, there's hard times coming. It may be before I die. It may not be. But there's hard times coming. And the hard times are going to require me to be spiritually thoughtful in an eternal way to other people than just myself. And yes, it's wonderful that it starts with me caring about my family. Don't get me wrong. I'm not undermining that at what all. But... I've got to work on being like-minded and broadening the tent, as it were, so that the ministry of grace of the gospel of Christ reaches as far as possible. So that verse 6, he says, may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, that is an enormous statement, one mind and one mouth. It means we're thinking the same thing and what we're saying, we, we mean the same thing. Here's hard. Here's the hard part about salvation. It's so personally refreshing. It's so personally satisfying. It's so personally transformative. That it's very easily, it's very easy for it to be very personal and all about me. But it's not all about me. It's all about me being brought into the family and about that family invitation still going out. 
and about that whole desire of God to bring us into that family and bring little ones to Christ. So he, he wraps up the whole discussion from chapter 14, verse 1, ends here, therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. That's the standing operational duty. To have an instant and a ready mindset that I'm ready, whoever I meet, have a spirit of receiving in Christ so that his love might change them in the manner in which his love has changed me. So how do we do this? <clears throat> I'm going to tell a little story. So when the school first started and we had the very first time we had uh, our expo, we had students doing um, musical presentations. And so I had an interesting experience. Now, we, we, we had a, you know, our standing rule of thumb is our relationship ought to be built on one thing, a respect for each other, so that in our appearance, we're modest, in our behavior, we're not eccentric. Now, I know what that means. It means what we just talked about. I'm thinking of others, not of myself. When people aren't really willing to be modest or non-eccentric, you know, they just kind of, well, this is modest to me. <laughs> but I remember um, a mom's son did something to present a presentation. And then somebody else did a presentation. And I had this really weird experience. Like, both moms came to me privately furious that the other child had did what they'd done. And it was just absolutely immoral, inappropriate. And they had all their reasons. And the part that so, so caught me off guard was like, they were both ready to take the other kid and shoot him. And they had the same exact attitude towards each other. And I'm thinking, well, this is interesting, because apparently what your child did was fine with you. <laughs> and I did ask, I said, well, how come you did what you did? Well, you know, in our case, it's like, had their little reason. <laughs> I like, my, 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 my first thought was, you know what? I'm never, ever, ever going to have a public thing again where people are allowed to come up and do something. I can't handle all the complaining. And I thought, well, that's probably not a good response. And so I tried to have a little bit of a rule of thumb and said, you know what? Let's be sensitive. I tried to invoke the scriptures. Said, Let's be sensitive in our presentations. We come from all kinds of backgrounds, literally. The church, the school has all kinds of denominational backgrounds. And let's, let's not make our gathering together about how we're different or better than you. Let's leave all that difference at the door and let's try to focus on how we are common. And so it, let's have a rule of order that says, let's do the things that we're you know, relatively sure aren't going to offend anybody. And so we put a little screening process through and. Um, when the screening process is properly used, we have pretty much avoided conflict like that in the future. But it's, it's tough. It's a tough process because nothing's more disruptive to the unity of the body of Christ than two families being at odds with each other because of different standards. And then for, for somebody in, in charge or in authority or responsibility, you know, you're the one looked to, to to figure it out. And it's, not, it's an awkward situation. Let's, let's, let's look at these little principles here. I didn't even number them. They're not meant to be comprehensive, just scriptural out of the study we've had. So there's a rule. And I, and I guarantee you this rule will always work. It, it, it will never fail. It will never fail. Rule. If you're loving your brother, you're abiding in the light. And there's no occasion of stumbling. Now that's really important to understand. We can say we love this and that, whatever, but if I'm loving my brother, I'm walking in the light. And we need to understand something about light. And I realize this is from the Gospel of little First John, and we haven't gone to that for a long time, but just put it this simple way, okay? 
God is light, and in him is no darkness whatsoever. And so we're the ones that have the problem with darkness. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So as a principle with my children, I always said, you know, we can have a good discussion and everything, but can we turn the lights on first? Can we first turn the lights on and have clarity of truth in the big perspective? Well, as soon as you turn the lights on, everything reflects back to who God is and what God's doing, not about me, not about what I want, not about my preferences and all this and that and what have you. So as soon as I flip the light on and I'm walking in love, all of a sudden, the standard isn't about me having my way or my conscience or my feathers being ruffled. It's about what is the manner in which we express truth so that people are invited into the cross of Jesus. And I want you to remember, you think this is difficult. I believe the church has a bigger problem with this than any other thing. Reflect back. Who was the church in Jesus' day? It was the synagogue. It was the practicing Jewish religion. And what, what, what was the problem at the Jewish synagogue and the practicing authorities of that religion? And it was, it was the church that God had established. Don't get yourself confused. What was their problem? They had such hard, strict, fast mechanisms of condemnation in place for those who weren't walking rightly that the gospel never went out to those people. And something changed when Jesus came along Jesus came along the vein of, you know what, you're a sinner, and God has chosen to save sinners if you only believe. And that was an attractive thing. It was very attractive. But who was it attractive to? The sinners. And who was it an offense to? It was an offense to sinners who thought they were not sinners, who thought they were righteous, they were the self-righteous. And so the problem that we have in terms of communal living we so can quickly distill out and have a set of practices that become so inappropriate that it's counterpoint. It's counterpoint to what the gospel is all about. It's counterpoint. So <clears throat> this is an operational truth. If you're loving your brother and you're walking in the light, then there's not going to be an occasion of stumbling. It's never going to be about you. It's never going to be about you or you getting your way or you having what you want. And I dare say today, just for frankness, the battle is heightened. And it's heightened. And it's heightened along the words of Romans 14. Those that have the liberty are in pure disdain, despising those that don't have the liberty. And unfortunately, you can read it on the internet if you wish. And those who don't have the liberty but who have scruples and they're concerned about this and that, it's so, you know, they're, they're ramping it up with such condemnation and damnation and judgment against other people. And it's just, it, it's the same old, same old. And the only one solution to it, walking in unity, as the scripture calls next person, excuse me, next part of the verse from Romans 16. Now, this is where I really, I said conclusion, we're going to the end. All the way at the end, Paul says this, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. And avoid them. It's like, why did you have to say that, Paul? <laughs> because all of a sudden we're brought, we're brought right back to the Matthew 18 community church principle where we have obligations to each other. That's Romans 16, verse 17. And then Galatians 5, 11, it's on the screen. And brethren, I beseech you, if you preach circumcision, excuse me, and I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do we yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. So <clears throat> these things work together. And here's, and here's what I want to say from a practical conclusion. Um, I don't know whether I'll do a final of the rest of chapter 16 next week or not. I'll, I'll, I may, but um, here's the matter, okay? These principles are like absolutely unrefutable. You cannot function whatsoever in a process unless you have love that is truly enlightened by truth from God so that the heart of your concern is not causing others to stumble, part one. Flip down to the last verse, part two or three or whatever. 
if you preach circumcision, you won't suffer persecution. Persecution comes from those who judge. The persecution comes from those who judge, because those are the ones reading the riot act. You're not keeping the rules. Why are you eating in church? We don't eat in church. We, we got rules. Uh, you know I'm teasing. <laughs> don't choke on it. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, <clears throat> we have to understand one thing. If I'm walking, if I'm, if I'm a verse 1, I mean, verse John 2.10 brother, walking in the light, I need to understand something. I'm going to be enduring persecution. And you're going to get persecution from those that judge. <clears throat> now, those that judge are always the ones living, using their worldview to judge other people. So it involves two groups of people. It involves the absolutely licentious, because the absolutely licentious always judge those who have moral values. Because you won't run with them to the same excess of riot, using King James terms, 1 Peter 3. So you're going to get persecuted by those that judge from their worldview, whether they're believers or they're not believers. Judgment comes. So, so in reality, if we're going to walk in unity, we have to be sensitive to have this. I'm going to walk in love and I'm going to expect to be persecuted if I'm walking in love properly. People are going to have their feathers ruffled and they're going to snap back at me. But the other group of people of the judge are not just those that are the unrighteous walking by the law of their own common mind. It's the, it's the ones who are self-righteous, who have their, their scripted scruples that are so tight that they hold you accountable to their scruples. And so that causes persecution also. Jesus was hung on the tree with that kind of persecution. So, here's the communal effect. Verse 17 of chapter 16, really kind of wrapping up. And, you know, Paul apparently understood that people got it, how to do this. And we don't. We don't get it, and we don't know how to do this. This is a tough one. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Now that's Matthew 18 in one verse. Matthew 18 sort of gives you the process. If I could, if I could suggest something to you, Matthew 18 is probably the most active, useful verse for the individual Christian because if we are having our scruples, as it were, before God as an individual Christian, and this judging and judgmentalism happens between families, it's not necessarily this church having a fight with that church and all this conflict. It's right in our own midst. We're having this tension. And so what we have is this obligation. And Matthew 18 tells us what to do. Now, you all know Matthew 18. I'm not going to go through it in detail. But it simply says this. If your brother has offended, go to your brother. Now, I tell you that offense is the offense of Scripture here, the scandal on a trigger offense that's causing me to stumble or causing someone under my authority or jurisdiction to stumble. <clears throat> you go to him and you show him his fault, that thing he's doing that's causing someone else to stumble. Now, I don't care what your theology is. I don't care what your liberty is. And I don't care how you came to your liberty. When this is the model of understanding that my first obligation to you is not what my liberty is, but what my liberty may be doing to you, I have a different outlook. And I join with Apostle Paul in 14, 7, 21 saying, you know what? The kingdom of God is not about me having my liberties expressed. It's not about eating. It's not about drinking. It's about joy. It's about righteousness. About the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the kingdom of God. That's what really counts. And so I don't ever have to drink again. It's not necessary for me to express my liberty to be an active, vital member of the body of Christ. And, and brothers and sisters, that should be our default. We should all to be at that place where my liberties are not important. I don't ever, ever have to do something like that again. 
but I'm attentive. But, but here's the process. And, and I want to say this in honesty and with a little degree of sadness. Matthew 18 requires you a process. Now look at the verse on the screen. Romans 17 says, avoid them. <clears throat> I have watched Christians in the 30s, nearly 38 years of pastoral ministry. I've watched Christians, and the normal process that Christians use is this. We just leave. We're just going to avoid them. We don't like those, we don't like those people. We don't like that person. We don't like exposing our kids, so we just leave. Okay? Just quietly leave. And the pastor gets a little... I was at one pastor's meeting, and I couldn't believe it because, you know, I hadn't had a pastor's meeting. I don't go to them that often anyway, but this guy, this guy starts telling the story about a couple coming to say, I just, I just want to start, I just want to tell you how much we've been blessed by your ministry. And as the pastor is telling the story to a group of pastors, he says, so I immediately interrupted her and I said, oh, why are you leaving? Because that's the introductory statement you make when you're leaving. You have a nice introduction but you're leaving. You know, the most painful thing for me as a pastor over the years has been people leaving without taking, without having the maturity, the character of heart to recognize I'm a part of a body. And I need to leave bloodied to a pulp before I leave. I'm going to do my part. I'm going, to, I'm going to allow myself to step into the arena where I'm the one persecuted, flogged, and hung on a tree. That's my commitment to the cross. That's my commitment to the body. And you know what? I'm frankly going to say it. It doesn't happen. We have people totally living outside of the scope of Scripture. It's all about them. And if their child gets offended by your child, they leave the church. And I ask, why did you leave the church? Well, you know, there's no, blah, 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 blah. Did you ever go to that? No, no, I don't like to cause trouble. Ripping and shredding the body of Christ so it's weak and useless is not a problem with you. And it's painful. It's painful because when somebody leaves a church like that, they have simply made a declaration. It's all about me. I go to church just like I go to McDonald's. They don't improve their hamburgers. I'm going to Burger King. And I wrote them a letter telling them so. And I've never been to McDonald's now for 30 years. That is wearisome. And that is wrong. You know, when you're part of a fellowship, you ought to be a part of a fellowship. You ought to care. You ought to care for the brothers and sisters in the fellowship. You ought to be asking questions about the needs of the community of fellowship. So, getting back to the individual thing, so. Somebody's lousy, snot-nosed kid defends your lousy, snot-nosed kid. Oh, that's right, your kid's not lousy and snot-nosed, I forgot. So, and you're upset. And I ask the question, well, what should you do? Don't you think you have a biblical obligation to, to walk in love and go to the parents and the child and bring up the situation and discuss it? And what if the parents are so... My little Johnny would never do that. You know, I actually have discovered in 48 years as a Christian, I mean 42 years as a Christian, 38 years of ministry, I've actually discovered that's a really big problem. Parents are so hypersensitive about their little Johnny that it's so skewed when we get into family relationships. It's always 100% about the other person doing the wrong. I'm sorry. That is not the game plan. The game plan is we're all sinners. And as sinners, we all bring detrimental, potentially detrimental influences into our relationships. But God loves. And he's brought redemptive powers into our life. And now we need to learn to walk in redemption. And we need to be careful for the situation and the understanding and work something through. <clears throat> should, a, should a church... I've, I've, I've seen these churches, okay, denominational churches. I'm, I come from the Catholic background, so for some reason I don't think that's denominational. <laughs> 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 
But I, there, I was at in, um, Cambridge, um, Eastern Shore. There was some little church there that I went to. We were having seminars there. And I noticed a rule book in the, in the, in the pew. You know, you have this, the hymnal and the rule book. I said, rule book? So I opened it up. I think I stole a copy. I have it on my shelf. <laughs> I think I got permission. It wasn't stealing. I don't know. But I look at the rules and it's like, as a denomination, for years and years and years, they meet together and make new rules. How everybody has to live. And I, I ran into, the first time I ran into that, this German, I forget, I thought they were Amish, but they were German Baptist or something like that. And I go into this little butcher shop and start talking to the young man and they're very conservative looking and the chicken house had been converted into a little Christian school for all the kids and I'm talking, having a good time. I'm assuming everybody that's not a Catholic that's claims to be a Christian is born again, so I'm a new, a new believer making mistakes about assumptions. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm talking to him and I said, you know, see so you got a school back there, I'm always interested in education and chat a little bit about that. And I said, so what do you do for high school? And he, well the law says we have to do it till 16, so we quit at 16. And I'm like, really? Mennonite's been publishing textbooks for years, always end at eighth grade. Because that's the end of legal school. If you go to school beyond that, you're in sin. So I said, I said, you gotta be kidding me. What's wrong with schools? Oh, well, we had a convention in 1872 in Philadelphia, and the elders gathered together and put into the rule book that schooling beyond the minimum required age is a sin. So we don't ever do. It's like the end of the discussion. It's in the rule book. And I'm starting to listen, and all of a sudden I get curious. I said, um, do you guys ever reach out to the lost? What does that mean? Okay, so that's the answer, no. I said, you know, people that don't know Jesus like you do. He looked at me, well, that's not our responsibility. They're going to hell and they better figure it out. I said, really, you have no evangelistic, help. why should we? We're the elect. I said, wow. Who voted you in? <clears throat> he, was, he was no more saved than the man in the moon. But here's what I want to talk to you about. This is what I'm trying to say. When you're a legalist, you rely on the rule book to comfort you. The scripture is what comforts us. Engaging in the difficult reality of life is where we learn to have community, where we learn to have life. And I might need to change how I behave or what I look like as I'm growing through the process of spiritual life. I might need to do that. You go to your brother, you point out his fault. If he doesn't hear you, forget it, buddy. I don't like your family anyway. Then you go and you get a couple other witnesses. Now, I've heard people that are bitter rehash stories and this is how I said, you can't believe what he said next. And this is what's supposed to help you not get to that step where you're rehashing what he said next. You go and you get two or three witnesses to come and witness what happened because maybe you didn't do it in such a good way anyway. You bring your brothers into the situation and you, again, show them his fault. And if he's still not willing to, re to resolve, but there's an assumption there. There's an assumption that the fault is really a fault and that these brothers understand that particular part of the process. And then, if we won't hear the brothers, then you bring them before the whole congregation, between the whole assembly, and you confront them. And then you do this, Romans 16, 17, and you avoid them. Okay, well, we're, not, we're gonna need to go our separate ways. But every, every family that leaves the church should leave under the resolved process that the scripture speaks of. Because it's part of the process. We're all sinners. And we all bring sin into the formula. And we might have said things in an unkind way or with an arrogant spirit or this or that or whatever. And those are the things that need to be gotten dealt with. 
Then when you reach the end, then when you have a cleavage, you're done. I've only had that happen a very few times in the history of our ministry. And every time that it's happened, at least I have the satisfaction of knowing we brought it to the end that we could, and where it stands now is we just don't have fellowship with them anymore. But it's not, we didn't have a pogwam and put up a pillar and burn them at the stake, which is what the church did erroneously for years. It's not about us imposing judgment. It's about us attempting to get along in community. So we've got to work at it. But every one of us have sin. And if you were at yesterday's workshop, so precious, for the first time, it just worked out that the men stayed and listened to Becky. And I heard Becky speak for the first time. Well, anyway, the men staying had a really interesting effect on Becky. She was like, because when she came on board 30 years ago, she said, now, there's two things I won't do. I won't stand behind a pulpit. And I won't, I'm not going to speak to the men. And I said, well, I don't know what you mean by pulpit. I mean, you have to stand behind a microphone and we're going to record you. So we've, usually she's down there at that microphone. But um, I said, as far as the husband goes, I'll tell you this much. I'll never, have an, I'll never have a meeting that says, men must attend this meeting and listen to you. But I want to tell you, those husbands are in charge of their wives more than you are. And if that husband wants to come and sit and listen to what you're saying because he doesn't trust you, you better let him be there. Okay, okay, that's fine. I understand that. So, so yesterday, all the husbands stayed. <laughs> it just was one of those little things that happened, and we all stayed. It was the sweetest presentation. But, but, but she did something that was so simple and so sweet in terms of accumulating the, eff the effect of our relationship. We're gospel people. And when I'm ever in conflict with another gospel person, the first thing I need to remind myself is I'm a sinner and they're a sinner. So we've got a problem at the start. And the second thing is recognizing Christ died and loves that sinner and is working in their life. Just like he's died. And so it changes the nature of the context so that we're learning how to get along instead of moving into this gravitational pull where <clears throat> if you don't consent to my perspective and yield, then that's it. We're, we're over. We're, having, we're finished. So it's important when, when we have stuff going on in our communities, in our families, I, I just want to suggest you have no idea. There have been times when families have taken my counsel and they've encouraged to go and confront and share. I don't remember one that ended negatively because of respect for someone so that you share with them your concern. Just having the respect for someone that you listen to their perspective and whatever's going on and allows you to engage and solve problems and understand. And you can understand and you can say things like, you know what, thank you very much for sharing that. I never, I never Never had an idea, but you know, it isn't about me getting to do what I want to do or my kids doing what they want to do. I appreciate your sharing and we'll take that consideration. Now this isn't an exact example of it, but I remember Sally and I, new Christians, <clears throat> at the, you know, one of the little evangelistic crusades that happened at the church. Anyway, something got talked about the peace symbol that was a part of the 60s. And Somebody simply expressed in a, in a message that that was actually a satanic symbol, the broken cross, and had a long history. And so it was really an offense to Christ. Well, it wasn't an offense to me before that, but when I heard that that peace symbol was a demonic symbol of, of um, uh, scoffing Jesus, I was, you know what? It, that's, not, that's not why I ever used it, but I don't need that symbol. And so we were just converted out of consideration. Then we were going to Washington Bible College when Sally went with me that semester before we were married. <laughs> and we're coming into, we're walking into class and we see this car parked along the road, not, you know, along the driveway with a peace single hang, hanging there, you know, a new convert with this peace symbol. And so we looked at each other and said, oh, I bet he doesn't know. 
So we tucked a little track under his wiper that just explained the satanic origin. And the next day when we came to class, we were so excited. Look, honey, it's gone. No more peaceable. <laughs> and we had just had a little exchange, but do you get it? Do you, do you see? When it's about you, you have a meltdown. When it's about the bigger picture of edifying and making sure we're not causing people to stumble, it doesn't, it's nothing. What we're doing is nothing. We can, you know, I don't ever, ever have to eat or drink anything again. It's not, I mean, not literally any, any food, but I don't need to be the cause of someone stumbling. That's the love of Christ. And if you're aware that somebody is in that position of, you know, awkwardly causing somebody to stumble, you have a spiritual obligation to deal with it in a kind, godly way, Matthew 18. Closing story, I realized I was an elder. I realized the other guy was an elder. Maybe I already told this before, but I had this young high school kid just graduated from Woodsboro High School. And his dad was the fire chief. And he had such a bad life, I couldn't believe it. Just, I mean, I, I couldn't believe what public schools were like, and that was way back in the 80s. And this kid was hurting, he was an alcoholic, et cetera. And so I just witnessed to him, he came to our little church Bible study. And um, by the glory of God, he got, he got gloriously saved, totally transformed. The kid did, yeah, the, the high school graduate. So it was, it was really exciting. And <clears throat> his life in order, he got a job with a local trash company picking up people's trash in, in the Walkersville area. And so he came to me after his first week on the job, all distraught. He said, he said Mr. Cox, uh, you know so-and-so who's one of the elders of the church? Uh, I picked up his trash and he has beer cans in his trash can. He drinks beer. And he just, he was, it was I, I saw this incredible attack on his foundational beginning in Jesus. And I said, well, thank you for telling me. Um, that's unfortunate. I talked to him personally about his need to, you know, guard himself from alcoholism. <clears throat> and I hung up and I made a beeline over that guy's house that minute and I confronted him. I didn't open up the Bible and give him a lecture on my views of alcohol or beer or anything like that. I took him to Romans 14 and I said, your liberty is being a trigger for sin in a long, young believer's life. And you need to make your choice between your beer or the church. You have no other choice. And he was instantly understanding. He knew the picture. This kid's spiritual life is more important than anything else. And he apologized to me and he got rid of his beer and he apologized to the young kid for just being a stumbling block. And that's the kind of sensitivity. It's the, it's the helping each other on the path so that we're not causing triggers to stumble. Microphone, are you going to take the camera on too? Go ahead. I, I just wanted to share, though, that there, um, we have to be careful of that because the danger is then the weak brethren can rule the church illegally. In other words, um, I, I've been attacked by dear weak brothers because I, you know, like you mentioned Christmas, you know, we celebrate Christmas, or uh, there's all these various condemnations that people as a weak person will come up with, like even, um, you know, pagan holidays, even the days of the week, or now the new thing is if you say God's name, uh, you're, you know, violating the law because you, have, you can't say Yahweh, and you also have to only use Jesus' name in, in, uh, in the um, Hebrew. You have to say Yahshua. And, you know, so I, I think I just wanted to, 
to mention that because I, I hear you and I understand what you're saying, but I also think that what you're also saying is we have to also be careful of being too harsh with that because the younger, the weaker brother needs to be edified to not judge the liberty of someone just because they're you know, walking in that liberty. And maybe the, the elder could have had an opportunity to go to that weak brother and to you know, clarify or, or whatever. I don't know. But I know I've had to stand up to people who are condemning me because I don't say Jesus' name, Yahshua. And I've had to tell them, I'm sorry, brother, but you're the one in sin because I speak English, and this is Jesus' name in English, and don't judge me. <laughs> and, here, and I go to the same scripture. <laughs> so I guess I just wanted to share that because I think I, it's so easy to be a kid con, you know, confused on this. And to just, I, I, so let me, let, me, let me go back to the, 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 the simple conclusion, okay? I, I can't mitigate what I'm, I can't. I can't taken what you just said and use it to modify the message because the message doesn't say anything that leads to that. The message said really simply, last three points, if I'm walking in love, I'm going to walk in light. And the light of God is going to be from the word of God and I'm going to have God's perspective. And if I'm walking in love with God's perspective, I'm not going to be causing an offense. That's not, it's not going to ever happen. It's an absolute guarantee. So that's the first thing. The last thing is, I have to be able to recognize that in the process of sin, sin becomes persecution and it causes suffering on the one that's persecuted. So if I'm walking in the light, I'm also ready to, to suffer persecution for Christ's sake. And don't ever surrender those two points of reference. Because if I'm not willing to suffer persecution, Scripture says this, yea, all that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Being godly introduces you to attack, to criticism, to disdain. It's going to happen. And it can be from, like I said, the unbelievers who are angry because you resent that, you know, their morality or they re and they resent your morality. Or it can be the legalists, the Pharisees, who are holding up all these rules and restricting their self-behavior to those who participate in that rule. But in terms of the process, the process is that I'm obligated. And, and when I, you know, maybe I didn't do a good job in that middle verse. The scripture says in 16, 17, we're obligated to operate out of Matthew 18. I'm obligated to mark those that are causing disruption. Okay? You mark them. You mark them in a group fashion. So what I, what I want us to understand is we've got to get to the point where for resolving a matter, it ends up becoming a church matter and we deal with it as a church and we walk through it. That helps us get the nuances of light and perspective and balance. And then we come to a conclusion. And the conclusion is if somebody's going to insist on walking in those things, then they're to be excused from being a part of your circle. They're to be excused from the fellowship. <clears throat> I said, we've had a couple of occasions of that. But those are the couple occasions, some of the hardest one that ever happened was, it was beautiful and sweet and tender the whole way through. But at the very end, it simply was a matter of this person's conscience was so severe that they couldn't stand the tiniest liberty that they saw were being taken. But because we went through the whole process that scripture talked about, we were able at the end to say, you know, there's an occasion in the scripture where the Apostle Paul and Barnabas reached a differing viewpoint on how to behave with respects to John Mark. And it was very heated. And in order to prevent the divisive reality of trying to forcefully work something out, they reached that place, let's just go separate ways. And that's that's the only process. We just, we just separate. Emphasizing a lot of complaint, uh, complaining I was having was, it's frustrating, it's hurtful as a pastor, as an elder, to continuously have in the course of history, people simply leave because they're offended. And they don't deal with stuff. That's what's painful, that's what's hurtful. But you go through the process, you still might leave. But it'll be a gracious departure. And this one guy that, that I, we had to, explain to him um, 
we not only can't concede, we have to bind you and say, we forbid you to bring that view into this church circle. And if, you, if your conscience is so tender that you cannot yield, then this is clearly a time where you need to find another place to fellowship. But I was full of joy. I was bubbling over with it. I love this man so dearly. And it was such a rest. And I've, and I've had such peace all through the years, knowing did the right thing. So when I've, got a, when I've got somebody that's overreaching, when I've got somebody that's overstepping, you know, they're going to get brought under. And if they can't yield, they're going to be asked to leave. So it'll be done clearly. It'll be done well. It'll be done within scriptural bounds. And that process, that's what I'm advocating. Let's not just keep it as a personal thing. Let's not get offended with each other and have a fragmented mindset that we come when we like it and we stop coming when we don't like it. <clears throat> to be a part of a, of a unified body that loves and cares for each other and handles circumstances properly and biblically. And, and, we'll, and, and you'll, get to, you'll get to the bottom of it. You'll, it settles out. You, you really clearly see what, what the issues are. Because it's a very narrow thing. The trigger is, I caused my brother to stumble. Just because my brother said it's causing me to stumble, I'll ask him a direct question. Can you give me three examples where there's been sin in your life because of this person doing that? Every time. Well, I don't have any examples where we've sinned. It's just, I'm afraid that it could in the future, maybe possibly, cause my kids to stumble. So, well, that's not, that's not qualified. It's not a qualified complaint. <sighs> We're to walk in love and community and caring for one another. And if we put that first model in, and I'll, and I'll just guarantee the tension's always there for two things. My conviction's so strong, or I'm so irritated at those people that have such a weird conviction, that I'm, I'm emotionally functioning out of the two sinful things condemned in Romans 14. I'm either a judge or I'm a despiser. They're both sin and they cannot be allowed in the body of Christ. And so there's a way to approach it and to get to it. And then we can go our ways and live happily ever after in that sense of the word. I'm really over, but I don't mind. Anybody have a last question? Pardon? Did you say something? Okay. Shall we pray? <clears throat> wow, Lord, it's really special that you would leave us in this place where we have to learn how to have community, where we're respectful and thoughtful of each other, attentive to those things that might cause sin in other people's lives. You didn't make it easy. You made it living, a living process, walking in the Spirit. So help us walk in the Spirit. Help us to love each other enough to bring to the surface, individually, family to family, those things that are troublesome to us so that we can work through the process, walking in love, in light, with the goal of glorifying you, Lord, on the earth. We know that it's tough, but we just ask for the grace to be faithful in it. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.